Hi, excursionists. It's me, Nari. I hope you enjoy this very special Christmas production. I thought it would be fun to have something we can all share leading up to the Christmas holiday. L. Frank Baum is a literary icon who introduced every one of us to the land of Oz. Please gather around with family and friends for this very special presentation of another of his wonderful stories, The Life and Adventures of Santa Claus. Old Age 1. The Mantle of Immortality And now we come to a turning point in the career of Santa Claus, and it is my duty to relate the most remarkable that has happened since the world began or mankind was created. We have followed the life of Claus from the time he was found a helpless infant by the wood nymph Nasile and reared to manhood in the great forest of Bursey. And we know how he began to make toys for children and how, with the assistance and goodwill of the immortals, he was able to distribute them to the little ones throughout the world. For many years he carried on this noble work, for the simple, hard-working life he led gave him perfect health and strength. And doubtless a man can live longer in the beautiful Laughing Valley, where there are no cares, and everything is peaceful and merry than in any other part of the world. But when many years had rolled away, Santa Claus grew old, the long beard of golden brown that once covered his cheeks and chin gradually became gray and finally turned to pure white. His hair was white, too, and there were wrinkles at the corners of his eyes which showed plainly when he laughed. He had never been a very tall man, and now he became fat and waddled very much like a duck when he walked. But in spite of these things, he remained as lively as ever, and he was just as jolly and gay and his kind eyes sparkled as brightly as they did that first day when he came to the Laughing Valley. Yet a time is sure to come when every mortal who has grown old and lived his life is required to leave this world for another. So it is no wonder that after Santa Claus had driven his reindeer on many and many a Christmas Eve, those staunch friends finally whispered among themselves that they had probably drawn his sledge for the last time. Then all the forest of Bursey became sad, and all the Laughing Valley was hushed, for every living thing that had known Claus had used to love him and to brighten at the sound of his footsteps or the notes of his merry whistle. No doubt the old man's strength was at last exhausted, for he made no more toys, but lay on his bed as in a dream. The nymph Nasile, she who had reared him and been his foster mother, was still youthful and strong and beautiful and it seemed to her but a short time since this aged, gray-bearded man had lain in her arms and smiled on her with his innocent baby lips. In this is shown the difference between mortals and immortals. It was fortunate that the great Ak came to the forest at this time. Nasil sought him with troubled eyes and told him of the fate that threatened their friend Claus. At once the master became grave, and he leaned upon his axe and stroked his grizzled beard thoughtfully for many minutes. Then suddenly he stood up straight, and poised his powerful head with firm resolve, and stretched out his great arm as if determined in doing some mighty deed. For a thought had come to him so grand in its conception that all the world might well bow before the master woodsman and honor his name forever. It is well known that when the great Ak once undertakes to do a thing, he never hesitates an instant. Now he summoned his fleetest messengers and sent them in a flash to many parts of the earth. And when they were gone, he turned to the anxious Nasile and comforted her, saying, Be of good heart, my child. Our friend still lives. And now run to your queen and tell her that I have summoned a council of all the immortals of the world to meet with me here in Bursey this night. If they obey and hearken unto my words, Claus will drive his reindeer for countless ages to come. At midnight, there was a wondrous scene in the ancient forest of Bursey, where for the first time in many centuries, the rulers of the immortals who inhabit the earth were gathered together. There was the queen of the water sprites, whose beautiful form was as clear as crystal, but continually dripped water on the bank of moss where she sat. And beside her was the king of the sleep phase, who carried a wand from the end of which a fine dust fell all around, so that no mortal could keep awake long enough to see him, as mortal eyes were sure to close in sleep as soon as the dust filled them. 
And next to him sat the Gnome King, whose people inhabit all the region under the Earth's surface, where they guard the precious metals and the jewel stones that lie buried in rock and ore. At his right hand stood the King of the Sound Imps, who had wings on his feet, for his people are swift to carry all the sounds that are made. When they are busy, they carry the sounds but short distances, for there are many of them, but sometimes they speed with the sounds to places miles and miles from where they are made. The king of the sound imps had an anxious and careworn face, for most people had no consideration for his imps, and especially the boys and girls make a great many unnecessary sounds which the imps are obliged to carry when they might be better employed. The next in the circle of immortals was the king of the wind demons, slender of frame, restless, and uneasy at being confined to one place for even an hour. Once in a while he would leave his place and circle around the glade, and each time he did this the fairy queen was obliged to untangle the flowing locks of her golden hair and tuck them back of her pink ears. But she did not complain, for it was not often that the king of the wind demons came into the heart of the forest. After the fairy queen, whose home you know was in old Bursey, came the king of the light elves, with his two princes Flash and Twilight at his back. He never went anywhere without his princes, for they were so mischievous that he dared not let them wander alone. Prince Flash bore a lightning bolt in his right hand and a horn of gunpowder in his left hand, and his bright eyes roved constantly around, as if he longed to use his blinding flashes. Prince Twilight held a great snuffer in one hand and a big black cloak in the other, and it is well known that unless Twilight is carefully watched, the snuffers or the cloak will throw everything into darkness. And darkness is the greatest enemy the King of the Light Elves has. In addition to the immortals I have named were the King of the Nooks, who had come from his home in the jungles of India, and the King of the Riles, who lived among the gay flowers and luscious fruits of Valencia. Sweet Queen Zerlene of the Wood Nymphs completed the circle of immortals. But in the center of the circle sat three others who possessed powers so great that all the kings and queens showed them reverence. These were Ak, the master woodsman of the world, who rules the forests and the orchards and the groves, and Kern, the master husbandman of the world, who rules the grain fields and the meadows and the gardens, and Bo, the master mariner of the world, who rules the seas and all the craft that float thereon and all other immortals are more or less subject to these three. When all had assembled, the master woodsman of the world stood up to address them, since he himself had summoned them to the council. Very clearly he told them the story of Claus, beginning at the time when, as a babe, he had been adopted a child of the forest, and telling of his noble and generous nature and his lifelong labors to make children happy. And now, said Ak, when he had won the love of the world, the spirit of death is hovering over him. Of all men who have inhabited the earth, none other so well deserves immortality. For such a life cannot be spared so long as there are children of mankind to miss him and to grieve over his loss. We immortals are the servants of the world, and to serve the world we were permitted in the beginning to exist. But what one of us is more worthy of immortality than this man Claus, who so sweetly ministers to the little children? He paused and glanced around the circle to find every immortal listening to him eagerly and nodding approval. Finally, the king of the wind demons, who had been whistling softly to himself, cried out, What is your desire, O Ak? To bestow upon Claus the mantle of immortality said Ak boldly. That this demand was wholly unexpected was proved by the immortals springing to their feet and looking into each other's faces with dismay, and then upon Ak with wonder, for it was a grave matter, this parting with the mantle of immortality. The queen of the water sprites spoke in her low, clear voice, and the words sounded like raindrops splashing upon a window pane. In all the world there is but one mantle of immortality, she said. The king of the sound phase said, It had its existence since the beginning, and no mortal has ever dared to claim it. And the master mariner of the world arose and stretched his limbs, saying, Only by the vote of every immortal can it be bestowed upon a mortal. I know all this, 
answered Ak quietly. But the mantle exists, and if it was created, as you say, in the beginning, it was because the Supreme Master knew that someday it would be required. Until now, no mortal has deserved it. But who among you dares deny that the good clause deserves it? Will you not all vote to bestow it upon him? They were silent, still looking upon one another questioningly. Of what use is the mantle of immortality unless it is worn? demanded Ak. What will it profit any one of us to allow it to remain in its lonely shrine for all time to come? Enough, cried the Gnome King abruptly. We will vote on the matter, yes or no. For my part, I say yes. And I, said the Fairy Queen promptly, and Ak rewarded her with a smile. My people in Bursey tell me they have learned to love him. Therefore, I vote to give Claus the mantle, said the King of the Riles. He is already a comrade of the Nooks, announced the ancient king of that band. Let him have immortality. Let him have it! Let him have it! sighed the king of the wind demons. Why not? asked the king of the sleep phase. He never disturbs the slumbers, my people allow humanity. Let the good claws be immortal. I do not object, said the king of the sound imps. Nor I, murmured the queen of the water sprites. If Claus does not receive the mantle, it is clear none other can ever claim it, claimed the king of the light elves. So let us have done with the thing for all time. The wood nymphs were first to adopt him, said Queen Zerline. Of course I shall vote to make him immortal. Ak now turned to the master husbandman of the world, who held up his right arm and said, Yes! And the master mariner of the world did likewise, after which Ak with sparkling eyes and smiling face cried out, Thank you, fellow immortals, for all have voted yes, and so to our dear claws shall fall the one mantle of immortality that is in our power to bestow. Let us fetch it at once, said the Fey King. I'm in a hurry. They bowed assent, and instantly the forest glade was deserted. But in a place midway between the earth and the sky was suspended a gleaming crypt of gold and platinum, a glow with soft lights shed from the facets of countless gems. Within a high dome hung the precious mantle of immortality, and each immortal placed a hand on the hem of the splendid robe and said with one voice, We bestow this mantle upon Claus, who is called the patron saint of children. At this the mantle came away from its lofty crypt, and they carried it to the house in the Laughing Valley. The spirit of death was crouching very near to the bedside of Claus, and as the immortals approached, she sprang up and motioned them back with an angry gesture. But when her eyes fell upon the mantle they bore, she shrank away with a low moan of disappointment and quitted that house forever. Softly and silently the immortal band dropped upon Claus the precious mantle, and it closed about him and sank into the outlines of his body and disappeared from view. It became part of his being, and neither mortal nor immortal might ever take it from him. Then the kings and queens who had wrought this great deed dispersed to their various homes, and all were well contented that they had added another immortal to their band. And Claus slept on, the red blood of everlasting life coursing swiftly through his veins. And on his brow was a tiny drop of water that had fallen from the ever-melting gown of the Queen of the Water Sprites. And over his lips hover a tender kiss that had been left by the sweet nymph Nasil for she had stolen in when the others were gone to gaze with rapture upon the immortal form of her foster son. 2. When the World Grew Old The next morning, when Claus opened his eyes and gazed around the familiar room, which he had feared he might never see again, he was astonished to find his old strength renewed and to feel the red blood of perfect health coursing through his veins. He sprang from his bed and stood where the bright sunshine came in through his window and flooded him with its merry dancing rays. He did not then understand what had happened to restore him the vigor of youth, but in spite of the fact that his beard remained the color of snow, 
and that wrinkles still lingered in the corners of his bright eyes, old Santa Claus felt as brisk and merry as a boy of sixteen, and was soon whistling contentedly as he busied himself fashioning new toys. Then Ack came to him and told him of the mantle of immortality, and how Claus had won it through his love for little children. It made Santa look grave for a moment to think he had been so favored, but it also made him glad to realize that now he need never fear being parted from his dear ones. At once he began preparations for making a remarkable assortment of pretty and amusing playthings, and in larger quantities than ever before. For now that he might always devote himself to his work, he decided that no children in the world poor or rich, should hereafter go without a Christmas gift if he could manage to supply it. The world was new in the days when dear old Santa Claus first began toy-making and won, by his loving deeds, the mantle of immortality. And the task of supplying cheering words, sympathy, and pretty playthings to all the young of his race did not seem a difficult undertaking at all. But every year more and more children were born into the world, and these, when they grew up, began spreading slowly all over the face of the earth, seeking new homes, so that Santa Claus found each year that his journeys must extend farther and farther from the Laughing Valley, and that the packs of toys must be made larger and ever larger. So at length he took counsel with his fellow immortals how his work might keep pace with the increasing number of children that none might be neglected, and the immortals were so greatly interested in his labors that they gladly rendered him their assistance. Ak gave him his man-kilter, the silent and swift, and the Nook Prince gave him Peter, who was more crooked and less surly than any of his brothers, and the Ryle Prince gave him Neuter, the sweetest-tempered Ryle ever known, and the Fairy Queen gave him Whisk, that tiny, mischievous, but lovable fairy who knows today almost as many children as does Santa Claus himself. With these people to help make the toys, and to keep his house in order, and to look after the sledge and the harness, Santa Claus found it much easier to prepare his yearly load of gifts, and his days began to follow one another smoothly and pleasantly. Yet after a few generations his worries were renewed, for it was remarkable how the number of people continued to grow, and how many more children there were every year to be served. When the people filled all the cities and lands of one country, they wandered into another part of the world, and the men cut down the trees in many of the great forests that had been ruled by Ak, and with the wood they built new cities, and where the forests had been were fields of grain and herds of browsing cattle. You might think the master woodsman would rebel at the loss of his forests, but no, the wisdom of Ak was mighty and far-seeing. The world was made for men, he said to Santa Claus. And I have but guarded the forests until men needed them for their use. I am glad my strong trees can furnish shelter for men's weak bodies, and warm them through the cold winters. But I hope they will not cut down all the trees, for mankind needs the shelter of the woods in summer as much as the warmth of blazing logs in winter. And however crowded the world may grow, I do not think men will ever come to Bursey, nor to the great black forest, nor to the wooded wilderness of brass, unless they seek their shades for pleasure and not to destroy their giant trees. By and by, people made ships from the tree trunks and crossed over oceans and built cities in far lands. But the oceans made little difference to the journeys of Santa Claus. His reindeer sped over the waters as swiftly as over land, and his sledge headed from east to west followed in the wake of the sun, so that as the earth rolled slowly over, Santa Claus had all of 24 hours to encircle it each Christmas Eve, and the speedy reindeer enjoyed these wonderful journeys more and more. So year after year, and generation after generation, and century after century, the world grew older, and the people became more numerous, and the labors of Santa Claus steadily increased. The fame of his good deeds spread to every household where children dwelt, and all the little ones loved him dearly and the fathers and mothers honored him for the happiness he had given them when they too were young. And the aged grandsires and granddoms remembered him with tender gratitudes and blessed his name. 3. The Deputies of Santa Claus However, 
There was one evil following in the path of civilization that caused Santa Claus a vast amount of trouble before he discovered a way to overcome it. But fortunately, it was the last trial he was forced to undergo. One Christmas Eve, when his reindeer had leapt to the top of a new building, Santa Claus was surprised to find that the chimney had been built much smaller than usual. But he had no time to think about it just then. He just drew in his breath and made himself as small as possible and slid down the chimney. I ought to be at the bottom by this time, he thought as he continued to slip downward, but no fireplace of any sort met his view, and by and by he reached the end of the chimney, which was in the cellar. That's odd, he reflected, much puzzled by his experience. If there is no fireplace, what on earth is this chimney good for? Then he began to climb out again and found it hard work, the space being so small. And on his way up, he noticed a thin round pipe sticking through the side of the chimney, but could not guess what it was for. Finally, he reached the roof and said to the reindeer, There is no need of my going down that chimney, for I could find no fireplace through which to enter the house. I fear the children who live there must go without playthings this Christmas. Then he drove on, but soon came to another house with a small chimney. This caused Santa Claus to shake his head doubtfully, but he tried the chimney nevertheless and found it exactly like the other. Moreover, he nearly stuck fast in the narrow flue and tore his jacket trying to get out again. So although he came to several such chimneys that night, he did not venture to descend any more of them. What in the world are people thinking of to build such useless chimneys? He exclaimed. In all the years I have traveled with my reindeer, I have never seen the like before. True enough, but Santa Claus had not then discovered that stoves had been invented and were fast coming into use. When he did find out, he wondered how the builders of those houses could have so little consideration for him. When they knew very well, it was his custom to climb down chimneys and enter houses by way of the fireplaces. Perhaps the men who built those houses had outgrown their love for toys, and were indifferent whether Santa Claus called on their children or not. Whatever the explanation might be, the poor children were forced to bear the burden of grief and disappointment. The following year, Santa Claus found more and more of the new-fashioned chimneys that had no fireplaces, and the next year still more. The third year, so numerous had the narrow chimneys become, he even had a few toys left in his sledge that he was unable to give away, because he could not get to the children. The matter had now become so serious that it worried the good man greatly, and he decided to talk it over with Kilter and Peter and Neuter and Whisk. Kilter already knew something about it, for it had been his duty to run around to all the houses just before Christmas and gather up the notes and letters to Santa Claus that the children had written, telling him what they wished put in their stockings or hung on their Christmas trees. But Kilter was a silent fellow and seldom spoke of what he saw in the cities and villages. The others were very indignant. "'Those people act as if they do not wish their children to be made happy,' said Sensible Peter in a vexed tone. "'The idea of shutting out such a generous friend to their little ones.' "'But it is my intention to make children happy whether their parents wish it or not,' returned Santa Claus. "'Years ago, when I first began making toys, children were even more neglected by their parents than they are now, so I have learned to pay no attention to thoughtlessness or selfish parents.' but to consider only the longings of childhood. "'You are right, my master,' said Neuter the Ryle. "'Many children would lack a friend if you did not consider them "'and try to make them happy.' "'Then,' declared the Laughing Whisk, "'we must abandon any thought of using these new-fashioned chimneys, "'but become burglars and break into the houses some other way.' "'What way?' asked Santa Claus. "'Why, walls of brick and wood and plaster are nothing to fairies.' I can easily pass through them whenever I wish, and so can Peter and Neuter and Kilter. Is it not so, comrades? I often pass through the walls when I gather up the letters, said Kilter, and that was a long speech for him, and so surprised Peter and Neuter that their round eyes nearly popped out of their heads. Therefore, continued the fairy, you may as well take us with you on your next journey, and when we come to one of those houses with the stoves instead of fireplaces, we will distribute the toys to the children without the need of using a chimney. That seems to me a good plan, replied Santa Claus, well pleased at having solved the problem. We will try it next year. That was how the fairy, the pixie, the nook, and the ryle all rode in the sledge with their master the following Christmas Eve. 
and they had no trouble at all entering the new fashioned houses and leaving toys for the children that lived in them. And their deft services not only relieved Santa Claus of much labor, but enabled him to complete his own work more quickly than usual, so that the merry party found themselves at home with an empty sledge a full hour before daybreak. The only drawback to the journey was that the mischievous whisk persisted in tickling the reindeer with a long feather to see them jump, and Santa Claus found it necessary to watch him every minute and to tweak his long ears once or twice to make him behave himself. But taken all together, the trip was a great success, and to this day the four little folk always accompany Santa Claus on his yearly ride and help him in the distribution of his gifts. But the indifference of parents, which had so annoyed the good saint, did not continue very long, and Santa Claus soon found they were really anxious he should come visit their homes on Christmas Eve and leave presents for their children. So to lighten his task, which was fast becoming difficult indeed, old Santa decided to ask the parents to assist him. Get your Christmas trees ready for my coming, he said to them, and then I shall be able to leave the presents without loss of time and you can put them on the trees when I am gone. And to others he said, See that the children's stockings are hung up in readiness for my coming, and then I can fill them as quick as a wink. And often, when parents were kind and good-natured, Santa Claus would simply fling down his package of gifts and leave the fathers and mothers to fill the stockings after he had darted away in his sledge. I will make all loving parents my deputies, cried the jolly old fellow, and they shall help me do my work. For in this way I shall save many precious minutes, and few children need be neglected for lack of time to visit them. Besides carrying around the big packs in his swift flying sledge, old Santa began to send great heaps of toys to the toy shops, so that if parents wanted larger supplies for their children, they could easily get them. And if any children were by chance missed by Santa Claus on his yearly rounds, they could go to the toy shops and get enough to make them happy and contented. For the loving friend of the little ones decided that no child, if he could help it, should long for toys in vain. And the toy shops also proved convenient whenever a child fell ill and needed a new toy to amuse it. And sometimes on birthdays, the fathers and mothers go to the toy shops and get pretty gifts for their children in honor of the happy event. Perhaps you will now understand how in spite of the bigness of the world, Santa Claus is able to supply all the children with beautiful gifts. To be sure, the old gentleman is rarely seen in these days, but it is not because he tries to keep out of sight, I assure you. Santa Claus is the same loving friend of children that in the old days used to play and romp with them by the hour, and I know he would love to do the same now, if he had the time. But you see, he is so busy all the year making toys, and so hurried on that one night when he visits our homes with his packs that he comes and goes among us like a flash, and it's almost impossible to catch a glimpse of him. And although there are millions and millions more children in the world than there used to be, Santa Claus has never been known to complain of their increasing numbers. The more the merrier, he cries with his jolly laugh. And the only difference to him is the fact that his little workmen have to make their busy fingers fly faster every year to satisfy the demands of so many little ones. In all this world, there is nothing so beautiful as a happy child. Ho, 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 says good old Santa Claus. And if he had his way, the children would all be beautiful, for all would be happy. Thank you for joining me for the Into the Night Anthology podcast production of The Life and Adventures of Santa Claus by L. Frank Baum. All original music, editing, and sound design provided by Omen Hawk Studios. Thank you so much to Project Gutenberg for making public domain books such as this one accessible to everyone.